going to give a talk today on snake bites. It's going to do a whole lot of other bites, but uh, only have 20 minutes, I'm told, and I don't want to do 15 minutes on snakes and then five minutes on everything else. So we're just going to focus on snakes with the uh, time that we have here today. Um, this is this is good. Can everyone hear me? Okay, make sure they can hear as well. All right. So, talk about snakes. I mean, have a snakes on a plane or on a stage reference here. Um, so, lots of snake varieties in the world and in the U.S. Um, we're going to focus on what we can find here in North America. There's a lot of exotic snakes out there that you know make 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 their way over here. Certain connoisseurs, pet shops, whatever, but for the most part, you know, you're the, we're going to focus on what you can find out here in the wilderness in North America, specifically in Kentucky. Um, so that's three main categories of venomous snakes. Um, you have the crotalids, uh, which are pit vipers. Um, that includes two cottonmouths, copperheads, rattlesnakes, and you'll you will see this frequently in Kentucky, um, where I lived in Virginia too. We saw, Saw these pretty, pretty frequently. Um, go out hiking, Red River Gorge. Might see uh, some folks getting bit there. Um, the other major category are the elapids, um, which in the U.S. Uh, the coral snakes we see that these fall into that category. Um, other snakes as well that are in the same family are cobras and mambas. Kind of more exotic, not something you'd quite see here in the U.S. Um, but you would see the coral snakes here. Um, finally, you see something called colubridae, something I read that's also technically a, a venomous snake. Um, they have, I believe, rear fangs, and they typically don't provide enough venom to actually make it medically, clinically significant. So we'll really discuss those here. The first two are really uh, what we focus on when we talk about venomous snakes. Okay. Um, the pit vipers are the ones you see uh, more frequently in Kentucky. Um, and they call pit vipers because they have these heat sensing pits um, and after they bite and envenomate their prey they uh, are able to sense where the prey is going and kind of track them um, until they die and then eat them whatever um, they always have the try so uh, you can categorize snakes i've never wanted to look at a snake this close to really look at its head or its eyes um, but they always have, will have the triangular head shape. You'll see some, some of these two in um, non poisonous snakes, um, but these ones will always have the triangular head. They will always have like the vertical slit like eyes. So if you have see the ones with the round eyes, you're probably okay. Again, I'm not going close enough to, to figure that out. Um, and so we'll go through the major types that you would uh, see here in Kentucky. Um, so this is a copperhead. Um, you can see it all throughout the state. Uh, so probably the most uh, common types that you would see here. Um, see them in rocky wooded hills, streams, kind of rotting logs. They kind of blend into their surroundings, might blend into uh, the fall leaves underneath. Usually not going to bother you at all. Um, but of course, like any uh, wild creature, if you uh, provoke it, they will do something to defend themselves and may strike out at you. Um, and this is some of their typical markings that you see. Uh, then you have the cottonmouth or the water moccasins. They're kind of seen more in the warmer months, kind of around swamps, lakes, uh, wetlands in general, um, the spring and then the fall. Uh, they move a little bit more uplands away from water. In the winter, um, they get further away and might uh, find, find them in some rocky areas, crevices, um, that type of thing. Uh, they're called the cottonmouths because when they uh, go on the defensive, they open their mouth and you can see the white lining. You can't really see it that well in, in this picture, um, but they will, you'll see the white lining that looks like cotton. So that's what they call the cottonmouth. And if you see that, you probably want to get away because it's probably about to bite you. Um, again, otherwise you should be fine if you don't bother them. Um, Pygmy rattlesnakes really seen just in a small area of uh, western Kentucky. Um, they don't get to be very large, uh, not over two feet in length for a full-size adult. Uh, they have a very small rattle, kind of sounds like a buzzing insect. Um, so these two are venomous, but because they are smaller, 
they typically are considered to be less dangerous. That doesn't mean that you can't really tell from looking at the snake, you can't really quantify how much venom that they're going to um, put it, you know, release with each bite. But with it being a smaller size, smaller fangs, they typically don't have the same volume that they can emit compared to some of the other snakes. But regardless, if you think you've been bit by this, you should still treat, seek medical care um, and get evaluated for that. Um, finally, the last uh, type of poisonous uh, pit viper that we see here in Kentucky is the timber rattlesnake. It's got a fun uh, the scientific name, the Crotalus horridus. It's probably pretty horrid. Uh, so that is the largest one of the venomous snakes in Kentucky. Um, I think it can go two or three feet up to five feet, uh, so they can get pretty large. They're usually in uh, really dense, heavily forested areas, and you can see that they have a pretty widespread distribution all throughout Kentucky. Um, they can be very secretive, so they're not typically found in places of high human density. So you're not probably going to run into these unless you're uh, maybe kind of seeking them out or maybe kind of in a really secluded place. Um, so in the, in the winter, they'll hibernate in uh, burrows made by animals, uh, rock crevices, um, really try to hide out. Um, when they're found, they'll remain uh, motionless, but if they are harassed, then they will strike you. And again, that does happen sometimes more frequently than it should. All right, briefly we'll talk about uh, kind of the uh, toxic syndromes that you can Ooh. see from pit vipers from the crotal. It's most significant uh, effect that you would see from these snakes are the local effects. Um, so you'll probably see, often if you can find them, you'll see two little fang marks. Um, a lot of times if people get bit on the extremities, so look for the hands and feet. You'll get some local erythema and edema, um, and you'll get swelling from there. Uh, so that's what you see here in this up, um, upper picture. And then and I can progress from there into uh, bullae, blisters, and uh, necrosis of the tissue. So the toxin actually gets into the tissue and causes myonecrosis, and you see this discoloration uh, that can spread, and that's from the, the dying tissue there. Uh, some of the more serious complications are, most commonly, are the hematologic complications. So that's why when we get these folks into the ER, we always check uh, labs, we check coag levels, we check fibrinogen, all to see how um, the toxin could be affecting their blood clotting. Um, so it can cause coagulopathy, it can cause a uh, decrease in your platelets, thrombocytopenia, it can cause anemia as well, bleeding, of course, um, and really far down the line, if it gets really severe, it can cause DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation where um, it basically just goes to crap and you're um, bleeding, clotting all over the place. Neurological symptoms are not as common uh, with crotalids. Um, there are certain species, I think there's the um, Mojave pit viper that they uh, mentioned that can, ca that's, uh, can cause um, neurological symptoms. When you do get these, you'll see them manifested as cranial nerve problems. You can have weakness and paralysis. You can have fasciculations um, of the face, the eyelid. Um, again, it's not, not really quite as common as the other complications. Uh, as far as systemic, um, mostly they'll be mild. You can get some nausea, you can get some vomiting, uh, some sweating, diaphoresis. Some of this, of course, might be provoked by anxiety as well. You just got bit by a snake, uh, you're freaking out. Um, sometimes you might have more severe systemic effects. It'll have changes in your blood pressure, have tachycardia. You can have a, a hypersensitivity, anaphylactic reaction as well. Um, in very, very severe cases, so you can get uh, respiratory distress, uh, angioedema, anaphylaxis. Um, and you can get, of course, local sweating, sp local spread, um, which is what you see finally in this uh, lower picture right here. It looks like he probably got a uh, bit on the hand and the spreading, swelling has spread um, up to the uh, shoulder and torso, and you can see that he now has um, erythema looks like some tissue damage over there on his chest as well. 
Um, it's kind of when you see this, you want to prevent this, uh, the effects from progressing um, as much as you can. And in, in the pre-hospital area, that's pretty limited, um, but you got to keep an eye on how it's progressing and how rapidly. It's like they can kind of see there, they've kind of made some markings of where the swelling is and it's clearly progressed beyond that. Um, so your other major category in North America of uh, poisonous toxic snakes are the lapids, which are coral snakes is the most frequent type that you'll see in the US. Uh, so this is your red and black and yellow snakes. Um, so there's lots of mnemonics. It's, so red on yellow, kill a fellow, and red on black, you're okay, Jack, something like that. There's various little fun phrases to, for you to remember. Um, but this is a picture that I, I found on Google. And again, it looks like it's pretty, the snake is pretty small. It kind of blends in pretty well with the, um, the forest leaves down there. So again, I don't think I would be bending over to check and see where the stripes were. I would just walk away. Um, these snakes uh, in North America are mostly found in the southern states. Um, so you see the eastern coral snake in Florida. There's the uh, Texas um, coral and Arizona one. You don't see them quite as frequently up here in Kentucky. I think it has been reported, um, but it's not really considered native to Kentucky. It's a great website that I found when I was looking all this up. It's like the UK Department of Agriculture. They have a whole uh, website dedicated to um, all the snakes in Kentucky, and they'll let you identify them if you're able to get a close enough look. Um, but those are very common to Kentucky. Um, so the toxicity for the coral snakes is a little bit different for um, your pit vipers. Um, so in contrast to the pit vipers where you get a, a whole lot of local uh, effects and local tissue damage, you don't see a whole lot of that with the coral snakes. Um, on the other hand, you see a whole lot more what we consider very severe effects. So neurotoxicity is very more, much more prominent for these. Um, so the most significant, significantly you could get neuromuscular blockade. Um, so it affects, I believe, the acetylcholine receptors at the neuromuscular junction, kind of like uh, paralytics do. Uh, so you can get ptosis of the eyes. You can get uh, problems with the cranial nerves. You can get uh, dysarthria, dysphagia, uh, which can be uh, pretty uh, uh, severe, and he had respiratory paralysis, which of course would be very concerning as well. Um, and oftentimes these symptoms can be delayed, so uh, you might not see anything for about 12 hours after the bite. So you might get bit and move right along, uh, keep on hiking, whatever, and then um, down the line, all these uh, symptoms get into effect. Um, <laughs> Compared to the pit vipers, they, these uh, snakes tend to have a greater frequency of dry bites, so when they bite, but they don't actually release the venom. So about 40% of their bites are supposed to be dry, compared to pit vipers is about 25%. Um, interestingly, uh, apparently there have not been a whole lot of uh, reported major envenomations um, or deaths. I think there's only, uh, in the past, since like 70s or whenever they started recording, there's only one death. Um, it was in Florida back in the mid 2000s or something. Uh, so it's interesting. I don't know if it's because you just watch these very carefully, um, and patient, patients get admitted and treated to the hospital, admitted to the hospital, treated in the ICU, and are just more aggressive and aware of this. So I'm not uh, quite sure what the reason is that that they have apparently not that great of a mortality rate. Um, but again, that's something you probably see a whole lot in Kentucky. Um, so this typical snake bite patient, um, like I said, you don't harm them, they most of the time do not harm you. The Ma vast majority are male. Oftentimes, actually, they're uh, mo most more frequently bit on the upper extremity, upper uh, the arms or torsos rather than um, the lower extremities. Lower extremities, it's more likely to be accidental, stepped on something and got bit rather than actually trying to pick up a snake that you are clearly not supposed to pick up. Um, oftentimes there's alcohol or drugs on board. Let me see if I can <laughs> can't make these uh, the videos work. Um, this is like the, there's a video of a guy who uh, cleans a cobra print and he's clearly a pro. And you might think you're that guy, but you're not. You're probably the junk guy with who's smoking a cigarette and trying to dance with a snake. Um, I wish they would. 
Um, so as far as uh, initial treatment for, um, for snake bites, first things first, scene safety at all times, make sure that the, there is not a snake when you're going to pick up the patient. Um, if it's possible to identify a snake from a distance, um, that can be useful for treatment. Um, so if they got a picture from several feet away, that's all they had, that's great. Um, do not recommend to try to kill the snake or bring it to the hospital. Um, <laughs> poorly, even after you, if, you know, if you cut off the snake's head, it can still have the reflexes. So if you try to cut it off, think it's dead, and you still get too close, it can still um, reflexively close down on you. So uh, would not try to uh, upset the snake any further um, after it's been bit. Um, and for the most part, pre-hospital is going to be just supportive measures. <clears throat> Obviously, if they have any airway problems or an anaphylactic reactions, you got to treat that first, same way that you would with any other type of anaphylaxis. <laughs> um, if there's a bite anywhere near the face, keep in mind that they can have those same local reactions. They can have the tissue damage, they can have the swelling and edema, um, and that becomes even more concerning when it's near the face and near the airway. Um, so you gotta keep a close eye on that. Uh, be ready to, you know, if, if they lose an airway, uh, intubate if needed. Um, IV fluids and pain management are gonna be key for these patients. It'll be very, very painful um, in the hospital. I've not, times I do have to give these uh, folks a lot. It can be really painful to have that, especially as the uh, tissue is swelling and uh, causing a whole lot of constriction. Uh, make sure the wound is clean, that you're trying to get rid of any gross contamination. Um, elevate the extremity. Usually say just elevate to the level of the heart. Say if it's higher, then you could let the toxins drain from the extremity into the heart and get more into the systemic circulation. At the same time, you want to try to reduce further swelling. Um, if you got bitten by the hand, you don't want it to swell up any further by leaving it down. Just keep it at the level of the heart. Um, can be useful as well to um, mark where the uh, distal edge, sorry, or the, uh, I guess, proximal edge of the swelling is so you can see if it is progressing. So if you, it's going to be a half hour, hour transport time and it's, you can see that it's swelling, it's progressing since then, that's something that's good to know. And typically the way we track these in the hospital is we uh, measure their circumference. So if you get the initial circumference of the arm or whatever extremity initially, then we can go ahead and uh, continue to track that as they, once they come in. Um, what not to do. So there's a whole lot of uh, internet advice and uh, folklore on what to do with a snake bite. There's a lot of things that you should not do. You should not try to suck it out. Um, and do, do not let uh, the patients try to suck out the venom. That All that does is expose the other person to, to the venom as well if they actually get it out. Otherwise, you're just putting more bacteria in the wound. Um, there's some mechanical suction devices too, apparently. Um, all that's going to do is cause more uh, tissue damage, and they're not actually that effective. So again, don't try to do these. Um, and try to cut out the wound site. I'm not really sure why you would do that. Don't. And then there's some weird things such as uh, cryotherapy um, or shock therapy that apparently have been tried. Again, not recommended. <laughs> I don't know how they would do that out in the wilderness. Um, the other thing that uh, has been kind of uh, discussed and debated about is uh, use of tourniquets. True tourniquets that would impede both arterial and venous flow are not recommended. Um, again, with the majority of these bites being from pit vipers and causing local tissue damage, what you're doing is you're decreasing blood flow, decreasing oxygenation to these tissues, and putting them at risk for more uh, tissue damage. Um, there's other something else that, uh, that is called a, a pressure uh, pressure immobilization bandage. Uh, or thought is just you're impeding, you're not making it too tight, so you're not impeding arterial flow, but you're just impeding lymphatic flow. So you're um, decreasing the amount of toxin that leaves locally and gets into the systemic circulation. Um, and theoretically, like I said, uh, when you have the coral snakes where they have more neurotoxic effects and less local effects, theoretically you could say that this could have a benefit um, and I think that 
there have been some pig studies done on this, which did show a benefit, um, not only seen on humans. Again, uh, you wouldn't really see these types of bites here. Um, there's also another study that showed that uh, both lay people and I think physicians as well were pretty poor at doing these pressure bandages properly. So not something I'd recommend. This is something I found on the internet about how to put this on. They have nice fang marks here and then they use a, a twig to splint it up and then they, for some reason, have the arm too when they've been doing the leg the whole time. So I'm not really quite sure how that got in there. Um, but apparently this is pretty popular in um, kind of for lay people to have uh, that this is, it seems to be this is what's taught, at least what I found on the internet for what to do for snake bites. Um, so it's good to bust those myths and um, if you see it, if they've done it, be aware that they might try to do this. Um, finally, definitive treatment. Um, for the curlids, your pit vipers, what we do is crofab, crofab, and more crofab. Um, I was going to do the protocol, but it's pretty lengthy and it'd be hard to see on this screen. Um, but usually if they have any signs of envenomation, um, so that involves changes in their labs that show coagulopathy or swelling, erythema, go ahead and dose them with four to six vials initially. And then that involves reassessment every few hours or so. If it's still spreading, give them some more. If it's still, still spreading, give them some more and keep going until it finally uh, slows down and begins to resolve. Um, so the, um, I'll get to the lap this then. So for coral snakes, uh, they, there's also an antivenom. It's called uh, NASCAR, North American Coral Snake Antivenom. Apparently this is no longer being manufactured. So there's still the supply that has been made, but it's not being made anymore. So it's kind of limited. Um, I believe for this, uh, what they do now is kind of do a lot of observation and reserve it for when it's actually needed. Like I said, they have a higher uh, percentage of dry bites, so you don't want to use it if it's not needed and it's in short supply. Um, so as far as transporting to a hospital, do you need to go to a uh, tertiary care center that has everything, or can you go to your local podunk ER? Um, basically, the, the important thing that you need to know is, do they have the antivenom available? If they don't, then they're not going to be able to do a whole lot. Um, let's see if I have on my next slide. Um, as far as like the complications of it, the concern is if you have significant extremity swelling, you can possibly have compartment syndrome. Usually we try to treat this first with more crofab. Sometimes you might need surgical uh, consultation. Um, if it's on the hand, you might need to get hand surgery involved. Um, so that's the case. If you're equidistant from UK and uh, Podunk Hospital, probably best to take them to UK. But um, otherwise, if they have the treatment that we need, if, you have, if they have the antivenom, they can go ahead and get the, um, get the treatment started. Um, of course, other complications may require intubation, might, may require, uh, um, may have significant respiratory compromise. Um, but again, that's only for very, very severe envenomations. Uh, let's see. That's about it. Oh, any questions? <laughs> we had enough. <laughs> I have a ten. Oh, I